you'll take a look at your bulletin. Debbie has an updated list of, of prayer concerns there. There are a couple I'd uh, like to mention. Some of you may have, have heard uh, Ben Carney, who um, attends here. He His roommate was in a near-fatal um, car accident, and he is at St. John's, and it, it's not looking uh, too good. I, the young man's name is Blake. I do not know his last name. Um, but if you would continue to be in prayer for that young man and his friends and family uh, as they are gathered around him. And at this time, he was involved in a car accident um, east of town, and um, it was not a good good situation. And so if you'll be, he was airlifted from Divernon to, to St. John. So if you'll be in prayer for that young man, again, his name is Blake, and, um, and for Ben and, and the family at this time. Any other prayer concerns or praises that you all would like to share or mention this morning? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, praise God. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Amen. If you guys heard that, they're they're helping out with a, a church that's doing some ministry on the streets, and so they're getting ready to do a blanket drive. If you have any extra blankets, uh, please get those to to Freddie and Loretta, and they'll make sure they get get use. Anyone else? Yeah. Continue to pray for, for Steve as he starts radiation this week. And uh, said there will be no ill results. Steve said nope. So we're going to pray that confidence as well. And um, also lift up their, their friend as we've been praying for, for him. He had surgery and now they're just waiting on, on results from biopsy. Gloria? Amen. Along those lines, yeah, Ben, I was going to say, it's good to see you, and you had a good week from what we hear. Yeah, just another praise for prayer cancer, and I know uh, lots of prayers were sent to myself and my family, and I've had lots of weeks with no pain medicine and no pain, and mm-hmm. almost a full functioning human. <laughs> <laughs> we'll ask Amanda about that, but no, it's good to, good to have you back, and definitely good that you're able to, to be off meds. Jean? Praise God for those moments we can come to come together. Anyone else? Any other prayer concerns or praises today? All right. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this church family. I thank you for what they mean to me and my family. I thank you for what they mean to each other. I thank you that you continue to grow them closer together. A lot of times it's through these very concerns and and issues that are mentioned, Lord, and um, I just pray that uh, you'll continue to, to bind us together through your love and bind us together through uh, care for one another, through our desire to study the scriptures and, and grow more uh, like you, to become like you, Father. That should be our, our desire and our goal. And Lord, we may never reach that perfection, but may our desire to uh, grow continue to to grow as well. And so, Lord, I just... Uh, lift up these prayer concerns that have been mentioned and we know that your hands are at work in them and we ask lord that through these situations the people that are affected may may come to have a a strengthened walk with you and if they are yet to know you lord that it will be the first run on the ladder that that gets them to you 
And so I just pray, Lord, that um, in all situations that as you are at work, um, your mercy is seen and, and experienced by all involved. Lord, as we get ready to open up your word, we continue to talk about being active in and having faith and, and putting it to, to work, putting it to the test, um, especially through our service. I just pray, Lord, that you'll continue to um, motivate us and continue to challenge us, continue, Lord, to um, convict us where we need to be pushed um, when it comes to serving you obediently. And so I just pray through uh, your gospel today as we open up John that we'll see um, how you served others and we'll imitate that in our own walk. We ask the, all these things in your son's name. Amen. If you have your Bibles and turn to the book of John, chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 5. I'm sorry, we're going to begin in verse 1. I don't know why I said verse 5. What's that? What did I say? Oh, 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 gotcha. All right. We're going to read John chapter 5. I'm going to start in verse 1. I don't know where we'll end up, but hopefully around 15, I think. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in our Aramaic called Bethesda, which was five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man, and this is where our focus is going to be today, one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there, Sorry, I'm sticking together. Been there a long time. He said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. And while I am going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, get up, take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was a Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, it is the Sabbath and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me. The man said to me, take up your bed and walk. And they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, and there was a crowd in the place. Afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and I just pray, Lord, that through this passage we'll see the heart in which you serve, and Lord, sometimes we get so wrapped up into making sure things are just right before we act on them or before we do them, and help us to see, Lord, that um, in your prayer and in your preparation, you are always prepared to serve where the Father leads. May that be our desire as well. Amen. So we're going to keep on moving through this faith in action part of our our year-long series, Um, and we're preparing our minds and our hearts to go and serve other people as we serve Christ. And Faith in Action is one of my favorite Sundays. It's been one of uh, my favorite things that we have done together over the last uh, eight years or so that we've been here. But I know for some of us, when it comes to serving and doing something good for other people, there is no shortfall of opportunities, right? If you look out there, there are many opportunities to help someone or to support this cause or to support that cause. There are all kinds of opportunities because all around us there are people in need. All around us there is someone who needs something. There are people sick in the hospital, and that could be an opportunity for us to visit and share God's love in that way. There are people in nursing homes, and often basically they are alone a majority of their days unless their loved ones come after work to visit. We could go and share God's love in that way. Uh, There are children that are abused and ignored by parents. There's the alcoholic and the drug addicted, and there's the food addicted, the homeless, and in some cases, there's a person that has given up on life itself 
And all of those people and all of those situations are opportunities for us to be Jesus to them, to be the church. Opportunities for us to share the love of God. See, if we are to take the time to make a list of people in need and therefore opportunities to serve, we'd be here all day. We'd be here for quite a while. There's probably not enough time to complete that list. And at least sometimes we, or should I say I, when it comes to this, I feel guilty uh, because we aren't doing enough to help. After all, we're supposed to be like Jesus and help everyone, right? We're supposed to be like Jesus and and help everyone. We're supposed to have this some um, positive response for every opportunity that presents itself, aren't we? But in reality, that doesn't always happen. And here's a question to ponder. While Jesus physically walked this earth, did he in fact help everyone? See, as we're getting ready to talk about faith in action, and as the planning team met, we come up with ideas, and oftentimes there are probably people that we could help that get left off the list, and Rather, because it was an oversight or we just don't know them. But for whatever reason, there are people that don't get included. And so I want us to think about that. Did he, in fact, help everyone? And here's another question today. Is Jesus helping everyone right now? Is he helping everyone? And I suppose if you want to get philosophical, we would answer, of course he is. Of course he is. Or we might say Romans 8.28. I don't know if you know what it says. But it says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God, to those who are called according to his will, or some translations say purpose. But that really doesn't answer the question, does God help everyone? Now certainly through his birth and through his life and death, and most especially through his resurrection, Jesus offers ultimate help to everyone who would receive it. He offers salvation to anyone who would believe But I believe if we get real honest, we would be forced to admit that while Jesus walked on this earth, he didn't physically help everyone. He didn't physically heal every person in need. He didn't physically attend to every crisis that was out there. And you might be saying, well, I don't don't agree with that. Or if he didn't, someone else did. And, And that might be a true statement. But as we look to be like Jesus and then we look to see who we should help and why we should help, we're going to get a little example today. The Gospels are full of stories of Jesus dealing with the multitudes of people who came to be around him, whether to hear him preach or to be healed by him. And he healed so many people. But the Gospels also tell us that Jesus would get away from the crowds too, didn't it? He got away from the crowds to pray. He got away from the crowds to be in conversation with the Father. He got away from the crowds to have reflection, even when there were still multitudes of people to be helped. And in the story we'll look at this morning, Jesus passes over an entire crowd of people, a multitude of people, my my translation says in the heading, to get to one guy, to get to one person. And the fact is that one person that he helped may not have even wanted to be helped. Right? He was there, but we we don't get any feeling or inclination that he necessarily called out to Jesus to help him. In fact, we see that he didn't he didn't call out. And certainly he didn't seem to respond in in a positive way to his healing. He didn't hurry to offer thanksgiving. He didn't hurry to to give him a hug or say thank you. In fact, people did not receive healing based on his faith, nor exercise faith in Christ after the healing. This guy didn't just go up to him and say, thank you, Father, for healing me. He didn't come up and say afterwards, now I believe, did he? Nowhere in there does it say he necessarily believes. He just claims who it was that healed him. And yet the picture I get is of Christ stepping over so many people that he could have healed to heal that one person, that one person who offered excuses, right? When we read the passage, he offered excuses as to why he didn't get healed in the pool. He offered excuses to why he hasn't moved. But Jesus stepped over the multitude of people he got through the crowd to get to that one person, even though that guy may not have been receptive to the healing Jesus wanted to offer. Go figure. Jesus still stepped out. He still went to him. Let's look again at John chapter 5. I hope you have your Bibles open. We are going to go through a few verses together, beginning with verse 1. We're going to see three steps to serving other people the way that Jesus did. And the first thing we do is this. If you're writing these down, I know some of you do. The first thing we have to do is you have to look past the multitude. You have to look past the multitude of people. Look at verse 1. After these things, 
there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep, by the sheep gate a pool, which in Hebrew is called Bethesda. I want you to take a look at that. If you go down to verse 5, then you see he has an interaction with the man. And he says to him, don't you wish to get well? Don't you want to be healed? See, best estimates probably believe that this is probably the second year of Jesus' public ministry. We all know that he did ministry for about three years. This is probably about year two that he's doing ministry. And the last time in the book of John that John shows us, shows Jesus in Jerusalem was chapter 2. And so in chapter 2, we could see that between chapter 2 and chapter 5, um, during that time was the Passover feast. And one reason Jesus may have been going to Jerusalem was for the feast. He may have been going for that purpose. Because it was custom that all males within walking distance to Jerusalem were required by law and by custom to go to that meal. Because it was a celebration of God's provision. And I believe another reason Jesus may have enjoyed feasts and the Passover feast in particular was due to the fact that a large number of people would be present. So he was, gonna, he was a people person. Jesus liked being around people. He liked talking to people. He liked being able to help people, I believe. He liked being able to have conversation, and he liked being able to observe. Now, how many, I mean, and this is for the males in our, our congregation today, how many of you like shopping? Any of you? Some of you a little bit? I hate shopping. But I like going with my wife to the mall to watch people and how stupid they can act sometimes, right? I like that. I, I enjoy observing. And I think Jesus did too. He liked to see his surroundings and see what was going on and see if there was a need that be, needed to be met. How can the church be productive in serving other people? Not necessarily by doing this all the time or doing this all the time, but by being quiet and seeing what's happening around us. Where's there a need that needs to be met? How can we do it? See, it only seems logical to me that when large crowds gather together at big events like a Passover feast, that there would be a reason for Jesus to be there. And there's a reason for us to be there. And Jesus would have been interested in being present among those in the crowds as well. He would have loved to see what was going on. It would have been filled with believers to teach and to be an example to. It would also have been an opportunity to find out about other opportunities to serve those who yet believed. And to share with them who he was. And to show the disciples how to serve and do ministry. John states that upon arrival, Jesus went to the sheep gate also called the pool at Bethesda. See, it's believed that this pool was a location, and it's still there today as far as the location, not the pool. And it's now St. Anne's Catholic Church. And it was built in the 12th century. And I was doing some history of this church this week in my study. It says the pool was fed by underground springs that would bubble from time to time. Now, that was kind of a gross image, right? I've seen things bubble before at the camp. It's not good stuff that bubbles up. But they're saying that it would have bubbled up, right? And that verse 4 states that an angel would come occasionally and stir the water. And so that would have been been a little weird to think about. Stuff that bubbled up, but then someone would come along and, and stir the water. And it makes me think, was it really an angel? Was it really an angel that would stir this, or was it just superstition? And I'm not going to venture to guess, but I do know that Paul would say to the Corinthians that Man has a tendency to worship the things of God rather than God himself. You ever thought about that? So here's this pool, and people were, were getting in it, and they thought that they were being healed as a result. It had been really easy for people to worship that pool instead of worshiping the creator of that pool, which had been God. Think about that in our lives. That happens. We start creating the things that God has created, which have been good to us, instead of worshiping the creator of that thing. It becomes very easy to make things of God instead of allowing God to be God. And so there's a little background to to that pool. People were gathering at the pool with the belief that it held healing powers, and it doesn't surprise me at all. But get this picture. Jesus arrives to celebrate a feast, and he goes to this pool where people are gathered, and sure enough, there's a large crowd that's come to the pool to be the first for a miracle. I don't know about you, but if you heard that Jesus was coming through town and he's healing people and performing miracles, how many of us would run to get in line? I would. I wouldn't make it very far because I'm not a good runner, but I would try. I would get there. But picture the crowd. Other people there, many were blind, many were lame, many were withering away, all of them were sick, and all had needs that they believed miracle water could cure. 
And then enters God himself to the picture. And it seems incredible to me to think about this. This is God coming in. And Jesus wouldn't really need to touch anyone, right? He could just speak them to healing, as he does. And this is God. All he has to do is speak the word or even think the word, and immediately everyone could have been healed, but he doesn't do that. It seems to have been like that everywhere Jesus went, people would just gather and be close to him and hope that by touching him or or talking to him or, or seeing him that they would be healed. The multitudes would gather, and yes, sometimes multitudes would receive healing But the gospel writers often, even most often, seem to depict Jesus as healing someone, but not everyone. Have you ever noticed that? When he's in these crowds, he heals someone. We know about King Jairus' daughter, and we know about other people that are around, and there's usually crowds of people in need as well. But we read about in the gospels of him healing one person, or maybe a few people, but never an entire group. Unless you consider the loaves and the fish to be healing, and, and then maybe so. But think about these examples. A woman who reaches out to touch his garment. A leper in the midst of a crowd. A demon-possessed man. And then on the examples could continue over and over. Even Jesus didn't heal everyone. His focus was oftentimes much smaller. It was often more dilated than that. Why did Jesus choose to just pass over all the others and touch this one individual? I'm not really sure, but let's take a look at verses 5 and 6. It seems to indicate that it might have been due to the duration of his illness. Look at what it says. He had been an invalid for how long? 38 years. Can you imagine that? 38 years. So Jesus sees him there. So we can read and see that it may have something to do with the time of illness, the length of illness. And so he goes up to him. And in the long run, maybe he chose this man because it would bring the most glory to God or or because it would move him that much closer to the cross if this man was an unbeliever. We don't really know the reason. But we know that Jesus looked past the many that were present and focused on this one individual. And secondly, when he found the one, his question was what? Do you want to be healed? That was his question. Do you want to be healed? And so that leads us to ask the question, where can I begin to minister to people? Where can I begin to minister to people? Well, the fact is, church, that we can't help everyone. We have to get past the multitude, but we can narrow our focus and zero in on one someone or one group of people and offer the best help that we have to those people in hopes that our service and our help will lead them closer in their relationship with Christ. And if they're yet to know Christ, it will lead them that much closer to knowing him. Once we look past the multitude and we begin to help people, we begin to have a focus of who we should help and who we should serve. Then we must do this, and this is the second point. We must remove the excuses. Remove the excuses. Remove the things that are keeping you from action. Remove the things that are keeping you from doing God's will. Again, verse 5, a certain man was there who had been 38 years in his sickness, been an invalid for 30 years, Sorry, 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, do you want to get well? And the sick man answered him, sir. And he started to do what? List all of the excuses, right? He started to say all the excuses. I have no man to lift me up and put me in the water. That's his first one. But while I'm, I'm coming, another one steps down before me. There's another one. And Jesus said to him, look, I don't have time for excuses. I have time to to love and to heal. And these excuses get in the way. So what's he say? Arise. Get up. Take your pallet and walk. And then scripture tells us immediately the man became well, took up his pallet, began to walk. And we know that it was on the Sabbath. And that obviously would go to cause some issues for the people of the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees. Now, to me, this seems like the silliest question that you could possibly ask. Do you wish to get well? If I was in that state, I would be doing everything I can to get well. I don't know about you. I don't like being sick. And my wife, if she was here, would probably tell you that I'm a baby when I get sick, right? How many wives would raise your hand and say, your husband's are baby? Okay. He can't see you if you want to. <laughs> but I don't do well being sick. But it seems like a silly question to me. Actually, the man's answer seems more foolish to me, right? 
Because it was, in fact, not an answer to the question, but rather an excuse for why he isn't already well. Jesus is saying, why haven't you done what you could do to better yourself? How many times have we wanted to help someone, and and instead of just helping them, we stop and say, but have you taken advantage of this program? Have you done this? Have you done that for yourself? Have you tried this? And so Jesus doesn't get through the excuses. He doesn't accept the excuses. He doesn't make excuses. He just says, get up. Get up and be healed. Arise and be healed. And I think about that. How many times when we go to serve people do we make excuses because we're uncomfortable of what God's called us to do? How many times do we make excuses because it's not necessarily what we want to do, but it's God's will for us to go do that? I think more times than we would probably like to admit that happens. See, wouldn't you assume that if someone says, can I help you, they might be willing to help? But instead, this guy gives excuses like, I've been burned before and I haven't got help yet, so you want to hear my story, but you're not going to help me. I've been here 38 years and no one's done it yet. Why are you any different? Folks, there's going to be people that we are called to go and serve, and they're going to say, Christians are hypocrites, and they're going to call you every name under the bus. But it doesn't mean that we're not supposed to help. It doesn't mean that we're not supposed to be Christ to them. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy to take the criticism and the ridicule, but I guarantee you it's possible to get through it. See, I just wondered, did this man not recognize who Jesus was? All these people were gathering around, and I don't know who he thought he could have been since a multitude of people got bigger and bigger around him. But maybe he didn't recognize who he was, and maybe he didn't recognize a valid offer of help when it appeared before him. But maybe that shouldn't surprise us so much after all, because we often make excuses ourselves, right? We might ask ourselves, don't you want to lose weight? Well, I've tried this new diet, and I've tried that diet, and it didn't work for me. Or maybe, maybe it's, well, I go walking, but that doesn't seem to help. Or how about, do you realize that you have a habit of gossiping? Anybody guilty of that? It's hard to admit, but I, I can be. Gossiping's tough. And maybe we'll justify it and we'll make an excuse and say, it's not really gossip, I'm just soliciting prayer support, right? (laughs) Or no, that's not gossip, I just have to vent my frustration, it's bad for me, my counselor says I need to let it out, right? (laughs) Sometimes, church, people, including us, are so full of excuses that we don't even realize we're in the need of help. Sometimes we're so full of, I can't do that, that we forget to appreciate what we can do. In this passage, it's almost as if Jesus didn't even hear the man's excuse. Do you want to get well? Then get up and walk. And here again, I find it rather incredible that the man got up and walked, and then what happened? No more excuses, right? He got up when he said, get up and walk, or arise and walk. He got up, and no more do we read about an excuse. There was no, give me a hand, help me up, help me gather my things, my palate, because I've been weak and invalid for 38 years. There was none of that, was there? No more excuses. He got up and did what the Lord told him to do. He picked up his palate and he walked. The man got up and it seems that he just walked away. See, it's not what you would expect. Here was a man of excuses. Jesus helped him anyways, and you might be thinking, in your service to other people, God calls you to help someone, and then they don't even seem grateful, right? You ever had that? They don't even seem grateful. And you might be reading this story and thinking, where is this man's gratitude? Instead of gratitude, he just has attitude, right? And maybe this guy really didn't want to be healed. Maybe he had come to acceptance of his, of his life and what it was, had become and what it was going to be. And when we study this story, this situation that Jesus was in, and when we think about people who have responded and will respond like this man did, the question arises, do we really want to be like Jesus when it comes to helping people? If so, then we must realize that we can't help everyone, but we can help those that God has called us to. And some of those that God has called us to are going to make excuses on why our help isn't going to be good enough. And they're going to make excuses on why we shouldn't be there. And they might not be grateful after you serve. And when they make excuses or they don't respond in the manner we think that they should, we can't allow that to become fuel for us choosing not to serve next time. 
I don't know about you, but I've been shot down before after serving. And instead of allowing that to shape me, I allow it to, to mold me in a way where I said, God, if this is what it's about, count me out. I don't want to do this. I can get rejected elsewhere. I'm not going to step out on a limb and do something that morally seems noble that you're calling me to do just to be shot down. But that's not what Jesus did. He went and helped everyone. It didn't matter if they were believers. It didn't matter if they were followers. It didn't matter if they were the same race. It didn't matter if they had the same economical background. He was equal opportunity. And even when he didn't receive the same response as some of those other miracles that we talked about, he still served. And he still went. See, as an individual, maybe we need to begin by focusing on one person. Like Andy Stanley said, one by one is a book that he has. It means that we can win people to the Lord by helping one person at a time, by putting our focus on one person. It's where our call to worship came from. And as a church, we must realize that we will not be a church for everyone. That's the reality. And we can look at Verdon and see that, right? 3,500 people. How many churches? At least 11 that I counted. At least. And there may be more. We're not going to be a church for everyone. And that's okay. Not everyone's going to come here. But let's pray that our prayers, we don't care where they go, as long as they go somewhere to be fed, somewhere to be involved, somewhere to get included. Would we like them to be here? Yeah. And for some, this will be their church. And as a church, we must realize that we can be a church for someone, some group within the group of people in our neighborhood, in our community that need to hear about Christ. When it comes to helping ourselves, we must realize that all too often we are making excuses to justify not moving closer to God's will for us. So we saw not only the man make excuses, but that because of, of that, we, the church or the servant, can create an excuse to not serve further because of his response to the reaction. So after we look past the multitude, and after we remove the excuses, then lastly, to serve like Jesus, we have to do one thing that I think we as a church need to really work on this year, faith in action. And that's this, follow-up is imperative. You have to have follow-up. You have to follow through. I love the game of basketball, right? I love it. And my daughter has had a trial for a team Peyton had a tryout uh, a couple days ago, and it's not through her school, it's through this other organization, and they went to free throws, and the first one, she's a pretty good free throw shooter, but the first one she shot, she it just hit the front of the rim, and she just missed it, and I saw it, and I, I can't talk to her, because they're not supposed to talk, but I saw it, and in my mind, I'm just thinking, follow through, and I'm trying to, like, not say it out loud, but also get her attention, like, follow through, she was getting here, she's left-handed, but, and I'm not, so I'll just do it this way. She didn't hear those, you know, basketball, and she was kind of just letting it go here but not snapping all the way down, right? We call it a gooseneck. She wasn't getting to that point. So I'm kind of getting frustrated because I know she can do it, but she wouldn't follow through, so she misses the first three. And then she kind of looks over at me, and I'm not supposed to make any motion, but I just go like this. <laughs> and they probably thought, what is he doing? Like, they looked over, but she got it, right? She smiled, and Peyton, Peyton pits up on it, and she goes, oh, she holds the ball, and she looks over and I'm just smiling like real big, yes, that's it. If we're going to be effective in serving others, we have to follow through. We have to follow up. Verse 10, take a look at what happens. Therefore the Jews were saying to him, the man who was cured, it is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, who who made me well was the one who said to me, take up your pallet and walk. They asked him, who's the man who said to you, take up your pallet and walk? But he who was healed did not know who it was. Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. But look at verse 14. What's it say? Afterward, Jesus did what? He found him. Jesus found him in the temple. Jesus followed up. He told him what to do. He told him how to do it. He broke away for a while, and then he followed up. He followed up, and he said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more. So he's saying, See, that stuff I asked you to do, it made you well. He followed up with them. Church, if we're going to serve others and eventually lead others to Christ, we can't just lead them to Christ and then leave, right? Nobody's going to know what to do next. We have to follow up and say, here's the Christ that I brought to you. Here's, here's Jesus that I shared with you. Here's your journey. But then we need to come beside him and how's it going? Any questions? 
things you don't understand, things I can pray for, things I can show you in Scripture, things I can tell you about. We have to follow up. We can do all the service in the world, but if there's no follow-through or follow-up, are we really helping people fully with all of our ability? See, Jesus didn't just meet the need, but he followed up to make sure they knew how to live life after that need was met. There has to be follow-through when it comes to service. There has to be follow-up. One of my favorite things was when I was at Judson, and the first, the first Saturday of every month, we would catch the Metrolink. And it was about, we were about 45 minutes, if you don't know where Judson is, about 45 minutes northwest of Chicago. And so we would jump on the Metrolink, and we would go into the city at Union Station, and we had probably 500 brown bag lunches every Saturday. It was one of my favorite things to do, to go and, and, and serve those meals and talk to people, a lot like what you guys are, are doing, and be able to, to meet those needs. But even more to that, just talk to them. And what we found out right here on Wednesday nights in churches around the world, that some of the kids that we get into the church, they were more receptive of the gospel when their physical needs are met, right? When their bellies are full, then we can fill their souls. I truly believe that. And I know that you guys have too because you founded Wednesday Night Program way before I got here. And that's what was going on when we went to Chicago, and that's what was going on here. Jesus met a need, and then he followed up. So what would happen? We would go in Chicago, and we'd, we'd hand out meals, and then there'd be a group of people, not me because of commitments I had with, with baseball and other things, but a group of people who would then go the next week and say, hey, here's another meal, but did you think about what we talked about last time? There was follow-through. There was consistency. And because of that consistency, there was growth. If we want to have growth that comes from our service, then we have to follow through. Verse 14 again says, Jesus found him in the temple. Jesus didn't just stumble across the man. He knew he would be there. He knew where to find him. And when we're, when we're honest with ourselves, the people that God calls us to serve, we'll know where to find them. When we're called to help them, we'll be able to find them again. And maybe it's through getting a phone number, but if they're homeless or they're in another situation, we'll see them again. We'll know where to catch them. We'll know where we can be able to intersect our paths. See, the man had been helped physically, but physical help is not what is ultimately important. Ultimately, Christ's concern was for his spiritual well-being, right? Because he went to him and he said, you are well. See, physically you've been taken care of. Then what's he say? Sin no more. Sin no more. He took care of his physical need, and then what did he do? He took care of his soul. It has been tried and tested and proven to be true that if we can meet people where they're at and help them with some of those physical needs, their reception to the gospel is going to come. It's going to come. The only possible place, see, what I like about this story is the only time in Scripture that I can think of where Jesus healed someone apart from faith. And what I mean is that no one approached Jesus on this man's behalf, right? A lot of the other miracles, people who knew who Jesus was or knew that, that Jesus was coming and believed in Jesus would come and say, hey, so-and-so has leprosy, can you come and heal them? Or, hey, my daughter has this going on, can she come and be healed? Or, hey, so-and-so. That doesn't happen here. This is one of the only times that I can account for in the Gospels, that in my reading, where faith doesn't really come into play. But the man obeyed and he got up and he walked, but he never asked for anything, nor offered Christ praise. He didn't ask for Jesus to heal him. Jesus just, just did. He didn't even offer a thank you. But Jesus still followed up with him. See, my prideful self would have been like, man, I just helped you. You can at least say thank you, right? That's not what Jesus said. But Jesus just offered him what to do next. He said, hey, yeah, you're healed, but this is what you need to do to stay in this state. Because he says, sin no more, that nothing what worse may happen to you. Christ looked for this man to offer him some good advice. Stop sinning. And if you look at this passage in the Greek, if you take a look at it in Greek, it translates to an, a phrase, and at the end it has an exclamation mark. It says, if you look at it in the Greek, it says, stop sinning now. It doesn't say stop sinning and just it. But if you look at what it says in the Greek, it actually translates and breaks down to stop sinning now. If you want to be healed, you want to accept what happened, you want to stay that way, stop sinning. He met the physical need, he met the spiritual need, he followed up to make sure that guy knew which direction to go. If he enjoyed his new life, if he enjoyed his new state, then Jesus followed up and said, this is what you have to do. 
If we're going to serve other people by mowing their lawn and raking their leaves and, and doing this or that, and for some reason they happen to be a non-believer, then we have to follow up with them, right? If that's our opportunity to get in the door and we say, hey, do you know about Jesus? And they say no, and we share. We've got to have some follow-up. Oh, I just came by to make sure that the grass didn't need cut again. But by the way, what would you think about that story in John? What would you think about this? We need to follow up. I'm not sure what all this means, but the only time I can see that Jesus helped apart from faith, it also appears to me to be the only time that Jesus ever associated a physical illness with sin. If you look at all of the miracles, if you look at all the times that he healed people, this is the only time in the Gospels, and I challenge you to go look this up, right? Don't take my word for it. Read through the Gospels. See what I'm doing? I'm trying to push you along. I'm trying to follow up with your spiritual walk, right? But go and see that this is the only time that it translates to um, someone, physical illness with sin. But nonetheless, Jesus follows up to see the progress of this man, and it serves as an invitation to be changed from his past and to be holy. We are a very important part as servants of Christ in helping people get from their past to holy. As we close today, there's a point that I would like us to understand from this passage this morning of nothing else. As we strive to be God's church in this community and we desire to help people and bring people into us, we must realize and accept the following truths. We will not be able to help everyone. We can't do it. And we won't help everyone. But when you think about you, who you are and you think about your life and why things have happened, what if your life happened and the things that have happened to you took place just so you could help one person? It'd be worth it then, wouldn't it? It'd be worth it. It would be worth it. Isn't it that equally important? Let's find that one person that we can help. That one group that God has equipped us to help. And then let's go all in and do it. And we have to realize this truth. We can't have every program or every ministry that is out there. I would like to, right? You'd love to have a, a great young adult ministry. Not just this community, but the world needs a strong young adult ministry in the church today. And I would love to be able to do that. Some churches do that really well, right? Not too far from us, Cross Church has a really, in Carlinville, has a really great young adult ministry. And when I see people that this church doesn't fit that for them, I encourage them to go. Go and find somewhere where you can be filled, where you can be a part of, that you can be fed. But we can have some ministries, and we can do them really well. We have a really good youth ministry. Kyle and Pam and Mike and Jan and all of you that have been a part of that have put in a lot of work, and it, it shows. And we're going to continue to have a really good ministry. Debbie and, and all, all of you that, that go downstairs and invest in the kids, it continues to grow. Why? Because we have a really good ministry. God's blessed us with that. Let's continue to pour into that. Let's continue to evolve that. We talked the other night. That's what you want. You guys want to evolve that ministry. Places you can look to grow. We won't have every program, but the ones we do, let's do it to our best ability. Let's focus on the gifts and the talents that we do have. And we must ask God, how do you want to make yourself known to this community at this time through this church and the gifts that we have? That's a valid prayer, I think, that we need to be praying. And when we pray that and we ask God, the next thing it does is it eliminates the excuses that we make. And it brings forth action. When you eliminate excuses in your life, it makes you act, right? When I finally say, I'm tired of being fat and i got to do something about it, and I eliminate the excuses, the next step is what? Action. Get on the treadmill. Go walk. Go do this. Go do that. We have to eliminate the excuses. We don't need to concern ourselves with what we can't do. There are enough things in life that we won't do and we won't do well but let's do those things that we can do to the best of our ability. Because we have to take faith that God is at work in us and will work through us if we stay obedient to him. And let's not say, well, I helped that one guy that one time and he didn't appreciate it so much, so my efforts today won't matter. Hogwash. 
That will only keep us from blessing other people who need it. And lastly, we must become like Jesus and follow up with those that we encounter. Not all the people we serve are going to appreciate it. But it makes our efforts complete that we serve them anyways. Some will be affected in a positive way, seeking to know more about Christ and his church. However, others will stay away. But guess what? When life happens and they don't know where to turn, guess where they're going to go? Here. Here. When they don't know where else to go, they're going to remember, man, what was the name of that church where that one time that guy or that gal stopped and and talked to me? Or they stopped and helped me get a meal? Or they stopped and and filled up my gas can? They're going to think and they're going to remember what happened. And let's let's not just say, I helped that one guy. Because it's going to keep us from blessing other people. But when things do happen, they're going to know where to turn. And in some situations, church, we may never know how they were affected by our service. We may never know. But you know who does know? God. God knows. And knowing that God knows should be enough satisfaction for us. Amen? Putting our faith in action will not always be easy. Sometimes it may. But oftentimes it won't. Some of us will skip the opportunities because... We will take the approach that, oh, there are too many people to help. Too many people to help, and we can't help them all, so our efforts are useless. You might be thinking, that's silly, but that's the approach of a lot of people today. I'd love to help, but my little gift isn't going to help, right? You ever seen that? A lot of people here are on Facebook, and you see these causes, and it says, for my birthday this year, I'm raising money for whatever it is, whatever cause. And sometimes I see those, and I get overwhelmed, and I think, man... $5,000 $5,000 or $1,000, well, my 10 or 20 bucks ain't going to help. Like, it's just not going to touch that. But that's the reality that we make excuses. And we think that there's too many people out there, too many efforts, so my little bit isn't enough. And some of us will make other excuses that we aren't prepared enough or good enough or smart enough or fill in the blank enough to help people. And if we do help, as we have in years past, many of us will ignore the last step. And we won't follow up with those we encounter. Maybe we think we did the work so we could sit back and wait for them to come back to us. When in reality, Jesus was our example, wasn't he? In verse 14, he went back to the man and observed how the man was doing. Even gave him some follow-up advice for his new life. How will we follow up our faith in action Sunday? I don't know. I don't know how we'll follow up as a church. Are we prepared for what's next? See, before we can even ask that question, we must first get past the multitudes and focus our efforts on one person or one group, which we do when we create the ministry opportunities. Before we can even ask that question, we must first eliminate the excuses that we can use to keep us from coming to church September 29th to serve other people. And before we can ask that question, we must have a plan in place to follow up with those who help serve. And respect their response to our efforts, no matter which direction it goes. Church, are you ready to put your faith into action? And then do for one what you wish you could do for all, and allow God's will to be done and to sort out the rest. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We pray with me. Heavenly Father. Serving can get overwhelming at times because we in our human state make it complicated. But in reality, Father, being a follower of you, you call us to serve. And we're equipped to serve, Lord, because you have equipped us to serve wherever you call us to go. Not all of us are going to be called to the mission field in the Philippines or to another country. Not all of us are going to be called to preach the gospel in our service with our words and with a sermon. But you do call all of us, and you equip all of us with a gift, and we can serve with that gift in a way that will impact the world. And while I may be blessed with the gift of preaching, there's others in here that are blessed with hospitality, others blessed with teaching, others blessed with nurturing, others blessed with grace and extending mercy. And Lord, that's what makes service within your church work. 
that you bring us together so that we're equipped to serve this mission field, this community. And Lord, why we would love to help everyone in this community, especially all those that are lost, the reality is we may not. So I pray that you help us to to narrow our focus, to find those that you are calling us to specifically. Help us to go and to, to heal. Help us to go and to serve, to go and to observe, or to go and just be present so that they may have an opportunity to know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, I just pray that we take faith and action seriously, not just as an event, as a day of service, but in our lives, Lord, that we take putting our faith into action and, and living, um, living out our, our talk and, and making our walk match those words. I just pray, Lord, that you'll continue to challenge us to do that, continue to challenge us to be your church and to make this life all about you and less about us. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. We come to our hymn of decision, and as we talk about serving others and, and making this, this life that we live not our own, but a life committed to the Lord, may that be your, your cry today. Is it your goal to live for Jesus? Is it your goal to live a life that is true and striving to please him? And so I just pray that um, if you're here today and you have yet to Except Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you are here and you're ready to live for him, make that decision today. I'd love to pray with you. I'd love to talk to you about who Jesus is. Maybe you're here today and you made that decision, but you want to rededicate your life to the Lord today. You want to make that, that path, um, you want to walk that path narrow with him again, then I would love to talk to you about that and pray with you. Maybe you're here today looking for a church family and God has called you to make this church your home. If there's any decision at all, please come forward as we stand and sing Living for Jesus, 462.
Have you seen it? <clears throat> As our deacons and deaconesses prepare to come forward for the Lord's Supper, I'd like to remind you that here at First Baptist Church, we practice open communion, meaning you do not have to be a member of this church to receive the elements or to come to the table. I simply ask that you have salvation that comes only through belief and acceptance as Jesus Christ of your Lord and Savior. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body which has been given and broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Will you pray? Heavenly Father, as we have our heart and our minds focused on being intentional this year and serving you and living for you. I pray, Lord, that in order for us to be intentional, we never forget our roots and where it comes from. And it comes from your one and only son's body being broken for us to take upon the sin of the world. And Lord, that if we were the only person in the world, he still would have took on the cross. That's how much he cared. That's how much he loved us. And so, Lord, I pray that as we come to the table today and We reflect on our own salvation. Help us to know and to make it personal, Lord, that even if our brothers and sisters weren't around us, that we could still be in reflection and still be in thanksgiving because he still would have been broken for us. All God's people said, amen.
It's the body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat. Paul goes on to say, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blood that was shed, and we don't take it lightly. We know that because of that blood, we were made new. We were cleansed and made whole. Lord, our sins, our sins cause us to be dirty. Our sins cause us to be incomplete. And we thank you for the ultimate sacrifice as we come to the table this morning. Amen. So the blood of Christ has been shed for you. Take and drink. Part of our tradition here at First Baptist Church is to gather and sing, Blessed be the tie that binds. And we might not be able to make it all the way around today, so if we want to cut through one of these pews, that would be fine.
says, may we displace, help us to put our faith into action. Lord, may we go and serve where you call us to, even if it means focusing on one person. May we not make excuses, Lord, and may we follow up and be people to the Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a great week. Right.